you guys asked for a deep dive into the Steve Lawson situation, mm -hmm. and um, it's heavy stuff. Even if you don't know him personally, even if like you don't go to his church, just you know. Yeah, it brings up a lot, doesn't it? It's yeah. about something bigger, for sure. I mean, we're talking about leadership, right? And what happens when there's that break in trust? Whether it's a pastor, a teacher, anyone in a position like that. Totally. It's like this ripple effect. I yeah. feel like even just the allegations, whether or not you know, anything's proven, it just has this huge impact. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Think about it this way in a church, in a community of faith, right? The trust is like everything. People are building their lives on these teachings, on what these leaders are saying. Right. So when something like this comes out, it's not just disappointing. It's, I don't know, it can really shake you. For sure. And then there's this whole thing about pastors, about leaders needing to be above the You can hide from the light, but the Lord will find you in the darkness of the night, in the belly of the great fish or the depths of the sea. His love will pursue you until you find finally free. You can run from the calling, you can hide from the light, but the Lord will find you in the darkness of the night. That's in the Bible. And that's where it gets really complicated. It's a high standard for sure. And it's there for a reason. You yeah. know, the verses we're looking at, they lay out all these qualifications for leadership. Right. Being above reproach, it isn't just about like not sinning. It's about living a life that doesn't even give a hint of anything wrong. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> because it does matter. Appearances, especially when you're in a position where you're asking people to follow you, yeah. to trust your judgment, your interpretation of the Bible. It all gets tangled up together. Yeah. So how would you explain that the difference between avoiding sin and this this idea of going beyond it to be above reproach? Mm -hmm. OK, Um. think about it this way. Let's say there's a teacher you really admire. Someone you think the world of, right? You respect them, their knowledge, their character. Right. Now imagine finding out they meet with students alone, regularly, in ways that can be easily misinterpreted. Even if nothing is technically, quote unquote, wrong. Right. Yeah. It makes you go, hmm, okay. Yeah. It makes you question things, right? Their judgment, their respect for boundaries. Yeah, definitely. And that's kind of what above reproach is getting at. It's not just about, you know, did they or didn't they? It's about being beyond question. Which is why I think this whole situation with Lawson is so interesting yeah, and so difficult. It makes us look at all of that, all these ideas in a real messy situation. Yeah, for sure. And it forces us to ask ourselves like, okay, if someone falls short of that standard, what happens next? What are we supposed to do with that? Where do we even go from there? So let's get into the specifics. When we talk about the allegations against Steve Lawson, what exactly are we talking about? According to the sources, I mean. Yeah, okay. So the main thing, obviously, is the alleged affair. Right. But it goes deeper, you know? The sources also talk about a cover-up supposedly going on for, like, years. And they suggest that uh, a confession, if that's even the right word, only came when it seemed like it was all going to come out anyway. Yeah, one source even uses the word tragedy. And that really got to me. It just hits different than, you know, calling it a scandal or yeah. something. It does, definitely. And it makes you think about the people involved, right? That word tragedy, it speaks to like a profound sense of hurt, betrayal. Yeah. It's not just about rules, right? This is about people's faith. The possibility that everything they believed, everything they built their lives on was based on something false. And it's important to remember the context here. I, I mean, Lawson wasn't just some pastor at a local church. He was, and I guess for some still is, this big name. Exactly. A respected theologian. Yeah. Author, conference speaker, huge platform. And then you add in the details of what's being alleged. Right, right. The age difference, for one, we don't need to get into specifics, but it's yeah. significant. And the fact that she was reportedly a graduate of the college where he taught, it just, it adds these layers of power dynamic. Totally. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to talk about any of this without thinking about, like, those biblical qualifications for leadership we were just discussing. Yeah, you can't separate them, really. Right. Those qualifications, they're not just like arbitrary rules, you know? They're mm. supposed to ensure that the people in charge, the ones with spiritual authority, that they're held to the highest standard. Absolutely. For everyone's sake. Mm. So, yeah, it gets really tricky. So when you look at these specific allegations, and I know we're not commenting on whether or not they're true, but just in terms of how they measure up against those qualifications. Right. Well, let's just take one example, right? Being the husband of one wife. Right. That's not just a legal definition, right? It's about fidelity. It's mm -hmm. about this deep abiding commitment that's supposed to reflect Christ's love for the church. It's huge. And some of these sources, they seem to be saying that 
even if Lawson were to repent, even if everything he supposedly did came out and he said, I'm sorry, they're saying it's not enough. Right. They feel like the damage is done. Right. Like that level of breach of trust, especially in this context, they don't see a way back from that. Hmm. Especially because, and this is key, they point to the fact that there hasn't been any kind of real public repentance, like a genuine acknowledgement of wrongdoing, asking for forgiveness from the people he led. So without that, they're saying any talk of forgiveness, of restoration. It's meaningless, just words. And that's where it gets even trickier, right? Yeah. This idea of public repentance, of somebody trying to earn back that trust. It feels like, I don't know, almost a whole other conversation. It is way more complex because now we're not just talking about like one person's actions. Right. Right. Now we're talking about a whole community and the possibility of like actual healing mm. redemption and whether that's even possible after something like this. Yeah. And these sources we're looking at, they seem to be saying like, nope, not possible. That even if Lawson is totally sincere, even if he means it when he says he's sorry, the damage is already done. Exactly. They're saying that somebody in his position with the kind of trust that was broken. Right. You can't just go back to the way things were. Yeah. Like they're saying that kind of restoration, it requires a different level of accountability. Mm -hmm. And it takes time. It's got to be more than just words. And this goes back to what we were saying before about being above reproach, right? Totally. It's like, it's not enough to just apologize. You got to show it over time through your actions. Exactly. It's about rebuilding trust, which, let's face it, is super fragile, especially in a church context, right? Exactly. Where people are coming from this place of like faith and vulnerability. It's different. So, okay. Big question then. What happens to somebody like Lawson, like hypothetically? Is there any way back from this, back yeah. to ministry, even if it's not the same role, the same platform? Man, that is a tough one. And honestly, there's no easy answer. It's something that like theologians, church leaders, they've been debating this for centuries, you know? Yeah. You've got some people saying certain actions, they're just disqualifying, period, repentance or not. And their whole thing is about protecting people, the community. Huh preventing more harm then you've got others saying look everybody deserves a chance at redemption right yeah that a changed life a truly transformed life it has to be possible that maybe that could lead to some kind of ministry down the line even if it looks different it makes you think about the stories in the bible too i mean king david right? exactly he messed up big time yeah but he still considered this like example a man after God's own heart. It's like. Right. And that's the tension right there. How do you reconcile those stories, those examples with the very real need for accountability and the fact that sometimes, yeah, there are consequences that like last. Right. And the truth is there's no one size fits all answer. Every situation is different. Every community. And that's why I think these conversations are so important. So, yeah. So what are we supposed to do with all of this? I mean, somebody's listening to this right now, maybe dealing with something similar in their own church, their own life. What do they do? What should they be thinking about? Man, if there's one thing to take away from all of this, it's the importance of discernment, of really like looking beyond the surface. Don't just take things at face value. Ask the hard questions. Yeah. And really examine what you believe about all of this. Uh. Leadership accountability what true restoration looks like because this isn't just like some theoretical debate you know right this well, stuff like has real consequences mm. for real people and it shapes the way we build like healthy communities communities of faith that's a good word discernment and just keeping the conversation going even mm. when it's tough which is i think what we've tried to do here right just unpack this whole thing all the layers and hopefully leave you with something to think about there was a man named Jonah called to preach the word But he ran the other way, ignoring what he heard He boarded a ship to Tarshish to flee from God's command But the storm came crashing down with the power of his hands You can run from the calling, you can hide from the light But the Lord will find you in the darkness of the night In the belly of the great fish or the depths of the sea his love will pursue you until you're finally free Three days in the darkness Jonah cried in despair But God heard his prayer in the deep of the lair The fish spit him out on the shore of dry land And Jonah went to Nineveh with the message in his hand You can run from the calling, you can hide from the light but 
But the Lord will find you in the darkness of the night In the belly of the great fish or the depths of the sea His love will pursue you until you're finally free You can run from the calling, you can hide from the light But the Lord will find you in the darkness of the night In the belly of the great fish or the depths of the sea His love will pursue you until you're finally free You can run from the calling, you can hide from the light But the Lord will find you in the darkness of the night the depths of the sea His love will pursue you Until you're finally free Freeze in the darkness Jonah cried in despair But God heard his prayer In the deep of the lair The fish spit him out On the shore of dry land And Jonah went to Nineveh With the message in his hand You can run from the calling You can hide from the light But the Lord will you in the darkness of the night in the belly of the great fish or the depths of the sea his love will pursue you until you're finally free you can run from the calling you can hide from the light but the lord will find you in the darkness of the night in the belly of the great fish or the depths of the sea his love will pursue you until you're finally free So if you hear him calling, don't turn away in fear For his mercy is a river, always flowing near In the storm and the silence, his voice will guide you home Just follow where he leads and you'll never be alone